All right, if I could ask that everyone find their way to their seat, please. All right, well, good evening and welcome to the second event in a three-part series that we are calling the SDSU Public Health Speakers Series. Uh, my name is Benjamin Schumacher. I'm the current president of the Graduate School of Public Health Student Council here at San Diego State. Tonight we have the great opportunity to hear from uh, deans of public health from schools across the country, uh, some CEOs and presidents, uh, executive directors of local agencies here, and we'll just be talking about uh, the future of public health, where they see it going, and how we as a public health body adapt and prepare for those changes. So before we get started, a uh, quick few things. Um, I would like to invite everyone to our third event of this three-part series. Uh, the event will be taking place on Thursday, April 5th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, this event will be held in the Aztec Student Union in the Council Chambers. And on that evening, we will have the opportunity to hear from two of our very own graduates of the Graduate School of Public Health here. And they'll be talking more from an applied public health perspective. Um, and then the very last thing before I bring up the director of the grad school here at San Diego State, tonight we will be requesting that the audience submit questions via Twitter with this hashtag here, hashtag future of public health panel. Uh, so members of our student council will be monitoring our Twitter page and will be selecting some questions that will be asked of the panel participants at the end of the evening if time permits. So very last thing before I invite up Dr. Matnat, I apologize. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for be, being here. I'd like to thank the faculty and the advisors that were involved in the application process to get the grant money that enabled us to have this series. I'd like to thank the council for their incredible and persistent work through all of the events that we uh, take on as a council on top of our own personal um, academic endeavors and personal endeavors as well. So I just wanted to give a big round of applause to our advisor, Dr. Buhai and Dr. Madnot and the faculty. And at this time, I would like to invite up Dr. Madnot, who will introduce our speakers. Do I need a microphone, really? Can, I, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, do I need it? It's yeah. a requirement. Oh. Okay, fine. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you to our student council for this amazing event, for putting this application together and being able to put this event together and bringing so many amazing people in one room to talk about an important topic, which is the future of public health. Um, our online audience, I hope you can hear us well. Tweet at us if you can, so we can actually take care of any issues. Um, but it's my pleasure to have alumni, faculty, students, all gathered here together and community partners to talk about this. Um, I get the pleasure of introducing our speakers, and I'm not going to introduce our panelists just yet. I'm just going to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Laura Magania, who is the CEO and president of our Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health. Uh, ASPPH, and ASPPH is actually the voice of academic public health. It uh, advocates on behalf of the schools and programs, but also on behalf of public health more generally. So it's an important organization nationally for, for public health. Uh, Dr. Magania, before joining us in August as the CEO and president of ASPPH, was the academic dean for the INSP Institute in Mexico. And uh, she has, in her very short time at ASPPH, already made significant contribution that has changed how the organization works. Uh, so we appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedule out in DC to be here with us and talking about this topic. So I'll turn the time to you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very, very much and uh, good evening. Buenas noches. I'm so happy to be here and it has been already an amazing day just getting to know the community and everything that you do. Really congratulations and congratulations and thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here and actually to participate with the, the whole panel with all the, our, our colleagues from the, from the public health uh, institutes and programs and, and, and schools. So uh, I think that the most important thing about this night is actually the conversation with you, the dialogue that we're going to have in, in the panel uh, and the discussions with the students, which you are really our reason to be in our schools. So I'm very proud to be here representing ASPPH, but I'm looking forward for, to talk and the, to the conversations with you. So what I'm going to do right now is actually just to talk about some of the issues that I think uh, we are facing right now in our world and our country and our state, and that we need to really uh, tackle from the, from, I mean, from the public health perspective. So the, there are four key messages that I would like just to introduce, and then we're going to uh, discuss them. The number one is mind the gap. Number two, focus on risk factors and advocate to correct the, the spending mismatch. Tackle the root causes of diseases intersectorally and globally, and stay alert to the emerging issues. So let's start with number one. So we know that in public health we have remarkable achievements, but we have pending challenges. So if we look just some indicators, let's talk about life expectancy. We know that life expectancy uh, during the last uh, century we really did a great job. Because in the last like 50 or 60 years, we have actually increased 30 years life expectancy. So that's already a very good news. The problem is that still the difference between Europe and Africa, it's a 20-year life expectancy gap. So all the regions are doing well, but we need to mine this gap. If we talk about uh, the DALIs, which are really the years that we are really losing for premature death or disability, look at uh, uh, North America, where this is the fourth, the one that uh, I show it there. So what's happening now is that, yeah, we're gaining uh, more life, and that's a good thing. But the problem is that because uh, our illness, at the, you know, in the last years of our life, we are living our last 10 or 20 years with disability. So that doesn't mean quality of life, right? So th that's a good thing that we live more, but we really want to live better, not just more, right? We still have huge disparities among countries. If you, again, look at the life expectancy indicator, we still have, like, for example, in Japan, a girl that's born there, they can expect to live 86 years, but uh, the same girl, if she just happened to, uh, to born in Malawi, she can expect 47 years of life. So that's a huge difference uh, between the countries. But that difference is not just between the countries, but it's within the countries. And uh, I'm so glad that you are working with your own communities because we need to start also looking and working with within our own communities. For example, this is DC. I'm, I'm living right now in DC. So the me this is the metro station. So from downtown DC, to Maryland, it's like 20, I mean 20 minutes uh, ride in the metro. That's a seven year difference in life expectancy. And I'm sure if you do the same thing here, you will encounter the same, the same thing. Let's think about another indicator, child mortality. And again, the good news is look at the world. We're really doing good in terms of uh, if this indicator. So if we just look at the global uh, perspective, I think we're, we're, doing, we're doing good. And if we look uh, at the different ages, we are, of course, all the regions, these are the other regions in the, in the world, all of them are dropping, and that's really good news. But the gap, again, in all the, uh, all the brackets, all the age brackets, still high uh, among the different uh, regions of the, of the world. So it's a huge difference. For example, the chance of a child dying before age five in Angola is 90 times higher than in Finland. And again, if you look at the, at the, at the regions and why they are dying, you can see that in high-income countries, they are very, 
you know, in the area of perinatal conditions. But if you go to the, for example, to Africa, they still uh, need some, uh, you know, other like even diarrhea. They are dying a lot of kids uh, from diarrhea right now, respiratory disease and, and others, right? So the child mortality remains a key concern in developing regions. Now, under five mortality in U.S. ranks number 43 among all countries, uh, you know, uh, in the world. So that's not, I mean, it's good because it's there, but still we're higher in the, you know, among our own, the countries who are similar uh, among us, and we are doing worse than, for example, Cyprus, Slovenia, or Cuba. So we have incredible, we need to uh, recognize that we have incredible overall success but we're failing to correct the social gap. The result is a world with huge disparities, both among the countries and within our communities. So I think that the first message that we can talk a little bit later is that we need to mind the gap in, in from now on. Another uh, key message, the second one and that I'm gonna try to make is that the, the government spending reflects the national priorities. So I want you to see w what the United States is spending in terms of uh, uh, medical care, and, that's, and I'm using purposely the word care. Uh, you know that the United States is the country around the world that, has, that spends the most, and not just you know, by some, that, but, but some money. They actually double uh, you know, the average in terms of the countries that are similar to the United States. And if we think about the, the average life expectancy here at birth, and we say, okay, it's pretty, pretty good, 78 years, but s still it, it ranks 17, you know, in the ranks among, um, I mean among the countries. So all these countries are doing better than the United States. And remember, the United States is the one who actually is spending the most in, in, in healthcare. So the United States has the lowest expectation of reaching age 50 among peer countries, and yet spend significantly more dollars per capita on medical care and a higher proportion in the gross, uh, in the GDP. This is another way to, to look at it. Uh, this is life expectancy, and this is health expenditure, and you can easily see that most of the countries there, they pretty much, yeah, spend uh, a lot in, in, in health, but they are doing well in their indi health indicators. But the United States, look at that. It's really, you know, it's spending a lot of money, but they are not doing well in terms of health uh, indicators. So what's, gonna what's the problem? I mean, we are spending a lot of money, but we're not getting, you know, a lot of health. So uh, the healthcare spending in the United States has really actually increased uh, a lot. But the problem is that Let's take, oh wait, let me just make the point here. Uh, right here to the right, you see uh, on which condi conditions does the United States is spending. And let's just take, for example, diabetes, which is number one, right, uh, spending there. Let's see uh, in diabetes, what are they, where are they spending the money? And we can see that 58% of spending on diabetes is on pharmaceutics, okay? Let's look at let's look at this in another in another way. This is how we are spending the money in terms of if you look at uh, that that was a 2016 uh, budget. I don't know if you can read that, but uh, when I look at this graphic, I was like, "Where is public health? I mean, let's see the hospital care, physician prescription. Wow, where is public health? Right? So then, when I look very carefully in this other, <laughs> in other, the 2% of the other, it's public health activities. Wow. We are spending that, now, now I wonder why we are, we are having all those results in, in health, right? So if you look at the burden of disease, we see that we are really doing very well in terms of controlling the infectious disease, because you can see that really, this is the 1990, how they, they rank, 
and then this is the actual or you know, close to the actual ranking. And you see that most of the uh, infectious disease, they're actually going down to being like the main causes of the burden of disease. But all of the chronic disease are actually going up. Look at, look at uh, and not only in causes of death, but also in the DALIS. Remember that the years that we lost in terms of disability and, and, and premature uh, uh, death. So again, communicable, uh, diseases is going to be, it is right now, and it's going to be, they're going to stay in here for a while. We need to really uh, dedicate, uh, you know, the, all our activities there, but it's very important to really control the mismatch here. Look at the prevalence in terms of the chronic disease, it's just, you know, ramping uh, out. If we see it at the causes of death, what again are the chronic, uh, are in top, Look at the associate risk factors, meaning that uh, what are the factors that make us being sick in these kind of uh, 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 diseases? And number one is dietary risks. That's number one. Already identified, it's already, you know, uh, we have the evidence. And if you look at actually all of them, the risk factors, and you talk about Blood pressure, uh, uh, I mean pressure, tobacco, body mass index, all of them. We very, very, you know, very soon we identify that they're all of them are preventable. If we look at this pyramid, we can see there the risk factors. So what, what are the things that make us sick? Are mostly behavioral things. Then the environmental, and then the metabolic, right? So sometimes we think that the mismatch is like this, right? Most of the money will go to the medical services, but we actually, we, to, we need to be, you know, uh, working in terms of the healthy behaviors. That's the problem. That's where we really started to get uh, into the disease. So my second message that we can discuss later is we need to focus on the risk factors and we really need to advocate to correct the spending mismatch. Why do social conditions matter? When we look again at what makes us sick, we very soon understand that it's not just the health system. We don't just need to work with health. We, there's so many other factors related to what makes us sick. So for example, food, uh, inco income, environmental quality, the neighborhood conditions, the housing conditions, education, all of these affect our health. If we just look at uh, here, for example, if we just look at this kid that goes to the hospital to whatever disease he has, and I mean, he, he, comes, he comes out from the hospital, but then we put this kid again in poor environments, with poor housing conditions, poor air, and then the mother doesn't have you know, a lot of uh, opportunities, maybe that she doesn't have a job, she, he, this kid will go to the hospital again. Why? Because we are not working with the underlying causes of disease. We're just treating him for the illness that he has, but uh, if we're not starting to work with the things that make him sick, it's a vicious circle. We were never gonna end. We really need to tackle the, the root causes, and the root causes of health and illness are here. It's not just in the health uh, uh, system, but we need to start talking or to, to be working with employment and housing and education and all the other sectors. Uh, and, and I just took two sectors just to, uh, to see how important it is that we need to really start advocating and, and working with the other sectors. If we just talk, talk about income, well, let me tell you the bad news is that this world, this country, we all uh, are getting so much inequal. For example, uh, the, this one here, the actual, is the top 1% of the population, the top 1% uh, owns more than 50% of all the, you know, the wealth of the, of, the, of the world, right? And the rest, the bottom 70, uh, the, the bottom 99 percent own the rest of the 50 percent. If you see what does that mean by this for this country, it's like the top one percent, the top one percent owns 
here, it's 43% uh, of the land. If, if we put uh, you know, all the population like in the land, uh, right here in the United States, it will look like this. 1% one one of the population will own 43% of the land. 5% of the top uh, will be uh, owners of the 45%, and the rest of us will be here. So this is how equal is our world, our countries and our world. And income uh, has already, uh, we have already evidence that is one of the indicators that really has an impact on, uh, on the development of the child and the way we live and, of course, our health. Another indicator, housing. Unfortunately, more and more of our communities are looking like this. You, you really see huge differences in the, in the housing. And this is real pictures of a community in the south uh, of the United States. So we're already seeing that, let's see why. We're already seeing that the United States is the country that spends the most in health care. We already see that it's not in health prevention, not inside, it's just in health care among all the countries. But at the same time, it's a country that spends the least in, in, in the, actually the other sectors, in the sectors, uh, and the social sectors. So it's really, I mean, it's, 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 it's both. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, unfortunately, like the perfect storm, right? Because we're doing, you know, wrong in, in, in both sides, in the health and also in the social, in the social care. And we have been told uh, recently and, uh, and lately that we are spending less and less in global health, right? Well, let me tell you that the next epidemic is just a plane right away. And this is, uh, it could be, you know, very pessimistic view, but this is just like a futuristic uh, kind of view in terms of just the epidemics in terms of the, of the infectious disease that could be emerging or re-emerging. So we're really not safe until everyone is safe. That's, I think, the message that we need to know is not that, that we, you know, want to spend money outside the United States, is that we need to do it for our own safety. So the third message was that to tackle the root causes of diseases, if, and we need to start working intersectorally and, of course, globally, too. And the last issue that I want to talk is that, yes, we need to be doing all those things, but at the same time, there are emerging forces or issues that are just there, kind of silent, and that we are not really realizing it very much, how, how they are growing. So at the same time, the public health people has to be aware of other, for example, and that I'm just talking about two issues uh, here. One is the annual deaths from alcohol, drugs, and suicide. They're, look at this. They're really growing, growing, growing. If you looked at just in the last 10 years, one million Americans have died of these particular three causes, which, of course, the three of them are preventable. A million. So that's, wow. I mean, that's something that's going there that we need to pay attention and we need to really do something about it. And the last one, fire, firearm deaths. That's also another big issue that we should really, as a public health uh, people, we need to be concerned and to do something about it. Uh, this graphic, it's about the top five countries ranked by GDP. And you can see the United States. I mean, it's really above, I mean, the, the, the death rate just for firearm deaths is 4.2. You know, the, the next uh, closest is Germany, which is 0.1. And of course, Japan, China at 0 0.07, right? Right now, and, and the statistics about uh, last year is that 15,000 uh, people uh, were, you know, they, they lost their, their, their life because of that. And we're talking just about death. We're not talking about injuries, which is double that number. So I think we have work to do. <laughs> so the key, uh, the key message number four was is stay alert to emerging uh, issues such, such as this. So just to conclude, I think that we are all faced with a series of great opportunities and they are brilliantly disguised as impossible situations at, as they seem, right? So thank you very much. I'm looking forward for our dialogue.
thank you so much for that message and right on point with everything that's happening uh, nationally. Uh, it's my pleasure now to welcome our panelists. If you'd like to take a seat up here, Laura and all of you. Um, I will do introductions and I wanna tell you that we have, I hand selected my panel. <laughs> so these are people that for very good reasons are here. They've done an amazing amount of work in public health nationally and internationally. And I'd like to point out that I didn't ask them for bi their bios and I decided to do my own versions of their bios because, and there was a reason for that, which was that there's something that intrigued me personally about who they are and what they've done in their careers. So I'll introduce each one of them and then um, I will open it up to Ben to start the questions. So. Just in order, Dr. Ayman Al Mohandes, he is the Dean of the Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy at City University of New York. He's a pediatrician, an epidemiologist, a researcher, an academician. And one of the, my favorite things about Ayman is his commitment to public service. He has been an incredible uh, contributor to public service nationally. He has, he has been elected to the American Public Health Association Executive Board and he's been honored multiple times for his contributions in those areas. His research is in, in mortality, health disparities, and global health. Um, I've introduced our next panelist, Dr. Laura Amagania, and then Dr. Perry Haltipis is the Dean of the School of Public Health at Rutgers. And he joined recently, actually, um, the School uh, of Public Health there, um, but he, one of his, I don't know if I want to call it your claim to fame, <laughs> but he has yes, done yes. a lot of amazing things. <laughs> one of them being uh, one, his book on the AIDS uh, generation, Stories of Survival and Resilience, which received the, the Distinguished Book Award in the field of LGBT psychology from the American Psychological Association. Um, and the, one of my favorite things about, um, about Perry what is actually that he's referred to himself, and I'm quoting, He's an advocate and an activist, and I think that's a great description of the work he's done nationally. Um, following him is Dr. Dean Smith, who is uh, the Dean of the School of Public Health at Louisiana State University. And something I didn't know about you when I looked, <laughs> looked uh, uh, for a bio was that he's the first health insurance associate of the American faculty. Uh, at, at, of the American faculty fellow, right? Is that the title? Yeah, which was really interesting in terms of the background within the world of health economics and, and what we've done. So, uh, and he is also the uh, editor of Journal of Health Administration Education and among a lot of other editorial boards that I could find you on. I was very impressed, <laughs> I gotta say. Um, following uh, Dr. Smith is Dr. Um, Brad Pollock. He is the chair of the Department of Public Health Sciences at UC Davis School of Medicine, and he's a leading researcher on the incidence and control of uh, cancer among uh, both childhood and adolescent cancers. And before joining UC Davis, he uh, was uh, the founding uh, the founding chair of the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. And finally, our amazing local uh, director of the County of San Diego Health and Human Services Agency. Uh, he's current uh, Hanlon Executive Scholar. And one of the things about Nick that has created a, an incredible relationship between the School of Public Health and, and the county is his really his amazing vision about looking to improve the health, health of all San Diegans. He, and he's done that through what I refer to as a very ambitious vision uh, for population health and wellness. And many of you have heard the name, Live Well San Diego. Uh, and he's, th one of the things that I love about our relationship between the county is that it has an impact not only on the lives of San Diego, but also our student population that train to be the future of public health, uh, both locally and nationally. So thank you all for being here today. I am turning the floor to Ben to moderate this panel. Thank you again for flying. <laughs> All right, 
before we get <coughs> before we get started here, yes. I'd just like to remind everyone in the audience uh, that we will be taking questions. Um, please go on Twitter and hashtag your questions with the Future of Public Health panel. At the end of our discussion time tonight, we will be pulling from those uh, hashtags and we will pose those questions to our panelists. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, the first question, what would you say is the current state of public health both across the country and here locally? So I'll just go ahead and open that up to the panel. If anyone feels like they would like to speak up, please do so. And I'm, I'm never shy. I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say one last thing? No. I'm sorry. <laughs> so all of these microphones are actually for the broadcasting that is being done by KPBS. Uh, so the microphones here do not provide amplification in this room, as you probably found out. Um, so if you are having a hard time hearing, please just raise your hand and ask the speakers to speak up and project more. Thank you. So, um, well, thank you first for the invitation to be here. I'm, I'm very honored to be here with you. I'm so glad so many students came out tonight. It, we have to go back to the snow in New York City tonight. <laughs> so, so feel bad for us. Um, so I actually want to tag on to something that Laura, Laura was talking about, which is, you know, this, this idea that there are these inequities in our society. And I, you know, very much like, like she, believe that people don't just wake up one day and decide they're going to have health conditions, right? They don't decide one day they're going to be meth addicts or they're going to acquire HIV or they're going to smoke cigarettes. But there are these structural inequalities in our world that drive people to these behaviors that get them to this place. So I, that's my point number one. Point number two is I think it would be a very, very, it would be very easy to just sort of throw one's hands up in the air right now and say public health is in a disastrous state given what's going on in our country politically. But I will say to you that I actually think this is a perfect time to be in public health. I think this is a time where it is a call to action for all of us to fight against forces that are trying to diminish the lives of people, which ultimately is a public health issue. So I think this, the future of public health is incredibly bright at this particular moment. If you adopt an approach to public health that's not just an intellectual approach, but one that's an advocacy approach, and one that is a, an approach that exists in your heart and in your mind, then this is the perfect time to be in the in, in this field. Well, as the other New Yorker on the panel, <laughs> I'm not shy either. <laughs> uh, and I will tell you something. Uh, Laura gave us some riveting information. One of the things was that this country is spending $3.3 trillion on health care. I will challenge you with this question, and I will tell you, if you were to count a trillion seconds backwards, would this take you to the Middle Ages? Would it take you to the birth of Christ? Would it take you to the exodus of the Jews from Egypt? Would it take you to the Old Stone Age? Or would it take you to the Ice Age? A trillion seconds would take you back to the Ice Age. We are spending every year 3.3 billion buckaroonies on health care in this country. And yet, we are in the state that we are in. This tells us two things. This tells us that our collective voices are not heard as advocates for the health of this nation. And it tells us that we need to steer ourselves in a different direction. One of the major problems answering your question as the state of public health is the state of public health workers and advocates. If we encapsulate ourselves in beautiful mm -hmm. alumni reception rooms like we are in today, we are in for a rude surprise in five or ten years from now. Our job is to take the public health ethic and the public health mission out to our communities, not only to our profession, but across the board to the service professions, to the policy makers and the advocates. Otherwise, we will be in an echo chamber talking to each other. I want every one of you 
this weekend to reach out to three non-public health professionals and tell them how important your mission is to your life. My hope and my dream is that half of you at least will not go into public health, but you will take the public health vision, the public health clarity, the public health enthusiasm to the world. We need you in law, we need you in policy, we need you in industry, we need you in housing, we need you in education, we need you in diplomacy, we need you in the airline business, we need you everywhere. And unless you are convinced that your mission is universal, we, my dear friends and beloved public health colleagues, will be sunk. We will not be sunk. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm from New Orleans. Snow is involved with putting <laughs> flavors on top of it, which we call snow cones. <laughs> but I sympathize with you. Uh, those of you who may see me see that I have a button on that says 50 no more, and it does not reflect my chronological sort of experience <laughs> here. Um, United Health Group puts out a ranking every year and I think very much about the minding the gap that we were told about. Louisiana ranks 50th in health status. Um, and uh, our work, our mission, and our plan is that we will not be 50th as time progresses. Now, I don't hope that we are not 50th because California somehow sinks from 11th to 50th because they discover beignets and crawfish mm -hmm. and cigarettes and alcohol that we enjoy so much, but that we're all pushing forward, but we need to, to catch up in this race and to mind this gap. But I, I'll say uh, something else that I was thinking about as, uh, as we were being chastised for send, spending $3.3 trillion on health care. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily a bad thing. We spend so much on health care because we think about the individual life before us when we're making spending decisions and we're willing to spend almost anything we have for that individual specific life. What we fail to do is to spend for the statistical life. For the, we don't know if they're going to have a heart attack today, tomorrow, or the next year, but we do something to try to prevent it. When someone has a heart attack, we, we do everything we can. If we could have that same enthusiasm, not for the heart attack before us, but for the potential heart attack down the road, and we convince people and they understood that this was their future, um, I would be happy if we spent $3.3 trillion on the immediate as long as we are spending $3.3 .3 trillion on the preventive aspect as well. So I'll, I'll chime in. I'm Brad Pollock from UC Davis. I am actually in a school of medicine. And so, uh, I mean, you mentioned a whole bunch of folks, diplomats, airline folks. How about physicians? How about medicine? So I, I have, uh, I've, <laughs> I've, established, I've established my career in medical schools, University of Florida. University of Texas Health Science Center San Antonio, and now at UC Davis in the School of Medicine. We have a Department of Public Health Sciences, so we function like a mini school of public health with a very large research portfolio. But I talked to a couple of you before we started today, and where are you headed? A couple of you ta told me uh, medical school, next step. And I can tell you at UC Davis, in this current class of MPH students, five of our students got into medical school. I think three of them are actually going to UC Davis. Um, I think the issues of public health have to permeate the medical industry. And you're seeing some of this happen in different places. Uh, as you all know, qualifying for medical school now is different. The MCAT exam looks a lot different than it does than it did 35 years ago because now there's the human element. And we have undergraduate programs that are pushing public health. I think those of you who are going into medicine with a public health background are going to be different physicians. And I think one of our things that we need to do is we need to change medicine. So I, I actually agree with Dean that that number, 3.8 trillion, 
sounds okay to me as long as we are spending it most appropriately. The other thing that's happening are market forces are changing the way healthcare is financed. In the old days, it was fee for service. The more procedures you did, the more money a health enterprise made, both providers, hospitals, and so on. And we are now moving to this model of value-based care, which means you're now going to be paid to cover a life, much like the HMOs like Kaiser, where it's a fixed dollar amount. And now you need to do the right thing for your health population, for your covered population. So you're seeing elements of public health that are moving into the, to the medical profession. I think that's going to be profound changes. And I know at the APHA meeting in New Orleans three years ago, the president's session was about the connection between public health and clinical medicine. They're inseparable fields. And so I'm not trying to argue we should all go to medical school or be in medical schools, but I do think these changes are happening now. They're starting to happen, and they're going to be both a combination of us driving it as well as market forces. So the local, we, we talked a lot about <laughs> <No>. nationally. <laughs> I think you want to so, so well. yeah, I, I was just taking it all in. I, and I agree with all the comments. Um, I agree that public health is everywhere. I agree that we play a key role. I also agree that with all the might of public health in its current form, it won't change and improve population health. <clears throat> There's a, this is a military town in San Diego. Anyone here from the military, former military? So, okay, don't answer this question. For the rest of you, <laughs> there's a little piece in the rudder. <clears throat> it's called a trim tab. It's a small piece. And the trim tab, uh, just a slight deviation of the trim tab moves those battleships. Public health has to become the trim tab. Public health has to become the community strategist. Public health has to be in all places, but has to be strategic of how we table set. That's what we lack in many communities. Well-intended doctors and, and, and practitioners and professionals. But who is setting the master plan? Who is setting that ecosystem that we know we're trained in, who is establishing those relationships? Who's developing the spoke, all the hub and spokes? And that work is taking place across the country. And proudly, it's one here in San Diego. And what we have learned, for instance, true conversation, I really appreciated the, the data around substance use disorders. Dr. Wooten, our public health officer, and I were having a conversation around methamphetamine and opiates as a leading cause of deaths here in San Diego. And a public health officer sitting next to our behavioral health director talking about the design of an organized alcohol and drug treatment around wellness. It was bringing in the power of the public health officer around health education and how we're going to connect with addicts because that's what we do really well with the drug treatment folks who know how to do drug treatment very well. It's a little bit of an example what I mean by how do we become that health strategist and when you do you can reduce heart disease as we've done in this region over the last 15 years. Heart disease is still leading cause of death in the country. It's the second leading cause of death in San Diego. Stroke, third leading cause of death. And it wasn't just meds that made that happen. So when you look at, is there hope? Can you reduce chronic conditions like diabetes and asthma and heart disease? It's unequivocally yes. Is it hard? Yes. But I agree what we're saying here is, how do we go do that now? That's the key. We understand what the problem is. How we do that, this is where public health does play a critical role back in that community health strategist role. I want to add something to what you said because I completely agree with you. I, I think that, you know, focusing on the issues of wellness is really key and, you know, empowering communities with the tools to, you know, to work with, with advocates and with healthcare professionals to improve the health is, is incredibly important. But I think for us as public health people also, there's another really big important piece, which is the, the, the health problems we face can't be the health problems of others. Othering in this country is extremely 
huge. And when you look at the charts that that, that Laura set showed us, the people that were most affected by those by those health conditions are the others, right? So it's like we're gonna. So I'll tell you a story. So in the early 2000s, when Bush II was president, and I had been doing HIV work for I don't know a decade at that point, um, all of a sudden there was an HIV problem in the United States. Right? Oh, it was solved. We didn't talk about HIV anymore. It didn't matter. There were no problems. And in fact, at, for those of you who don't know this, we did not have a national HIV strategy until President Obama. We had a strategy for Africa, but we didn't have a strategy for our own country. <laughs> What's up with that? So what that's about is about othering. It's about health problems being the, health, the problems of other people. You as public health people, and I agree, they should be in all these fields, including politics, right? need to go out there and know the people that you're working with. It's not enough to sit behind a computer and crunch numbers, right? Sometimes I joke, the school that I inherited that I'm very proud of right now, some of the faculty I inherited can tell you the difference between a meth addict and an elephant, right? <laughs> that should not be what public health people are able to do. Public health people need to be face-to-face -face with the community. Public health started out with community engagement, with advocacy. We've lost our way. We became too intellectualized, too academicalized. That's not really a word, but I'm making it up, <laughs> right? Academicized, whatever. We need to bring it back to the people, That right? new word might give you tenure, though. Uh -huh. Oh, honey, I've had tenure for a decade. I'm good. Uh, but, but, I, but, but, I, but I think it's, as, uh, as Iman said, talk to three people. Also go out into those communities that are affected and see what's going on. Don't be afraid to go there, right? Don't other those people. Engage with them. Be compassionate. Have empathy. Yeah. So I'm going to say something. How many of you, or a question, how many of you consider yourself a public health professional in the room? How many of you consider yourself an advocate? Very good. And that's really what it boils down to, is that the two intersect. You cannot do public health without thinking of advocacy. Third question, also, yeah. how many of you voted in the last election? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, that's a room that wouldn't look the same way if you went somewhere else. Right. If we <laughs> asked how many people voted across our county, across our state, and nationally, the numbers are abysmal. It's an embarrassment. As an immigrant, I think it's an extreme privilege that we get to, to vote. And so my message beyond all the things we've said, is engage in politics, advocacy, voter registration, voter turnout. Those are all important parts of what we do in public health. It's not something to take lightly. I, I also want to disagree slightly by saying it's okay for us to spend $3.3 .3 trillion <laughs> on health care. Um, I, I don't to. agree at all. And any of us that has spoken to their grandmother has heard that uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. uh, complacency in accepting the, f the, the state of uh, epso facto, or the way things are, is not the way of the future in public health. We live in an economy that's straddled with debt. We live in a, a situation where every legislation that is passed is passed with a mindfulness on cost efficiency. There is no way for us to assume that health care is independent of education or roads or housing or social well-being. The way we spend mindlessly on health care is because it is poorly strategized and poorly devised. The president of the Association of Schools of Public Health showed you on her slide the gap, how much we are spending on health care compared to other industrialized countries per capita. And that shows you that we are spending mindlessly. Part of the public health ethic is cost efficiency and cost saving. The fact that we're spending so much is nothing we should be proud of. We should help politicians and policymakers redirect expenditures towards savings. And that is our responsibility. I was a little bit worried when my dear friend Hala asked you, 
How many of you are public health professionals? The minute you stepped into that school as a student, you became a public health professional because I'll tell you a secret. Till the last day you are in this profession, you will be a student. I am the dean of the School of Public Health and I'm part of this learning community. Don't assume because you're students that you're not part of the profession. All right, thank you all. So now that we know what the current state of public <laughs> health is, <laughs> or have discussed Maybe. it, <laughs> the follow-up question that I would ask is, based on your experience, your expertise, and your position, what is the future? What do you see public health as a whole becoming? And the second part of that question is, how fast do you see us getting there? So what is it becoming? And when will it become that, in your opinion? L let me uh, just uh, poke, venture out a little bit here. So uh, it's kind of like it, public health is very broad. And if you were to substitute the word medicine for that, you couldn't answer it very easily. And I want to just bring people back to a couple things. I, I, I didn't raise my hand when you asked if, if we're advocates. I, I feel I'm an advocate for the scientific research community. I don't do as much out in, in the face of, of the, uh, the public, even though I'm a public health person. Um, I, I want to sort of bring us back to, you know, you, you guys have different disciplines you're being trained in in public health. There's no such thing as just public health, right? Your epidemiology, health policy, there's a lot of different disciplines that are represented within public health. Much as in medicine, you've got many disciplines within medicine. And uh, there are a number of us, I wouldn't say n none of us at this table here, but I'm interested in discovery, in science and discovery. I think public health is a scientific discipline in addition to being an action discipline. And I don't want to lose sight of the fact that discovery is a lot of what we do to figure out what, what's going on with the gap. Now, now, alone, it's not sufficient to actually change things. but coupled with action and implementation of what we've learned in discovery, you can actually move the needle. But without understanding the determinants of those gaps there, and that means doing sort of basic, not basic, but doing applied research, you, you, you're, you're going to be doing a lot of advocacy and pounding away without really knowing what you're doing efficiently and, and correctly. Right. So um, uh, I, I should say my name is Dean, and I'm an economist. and no, there's no 12-step program that's going to get me out of that. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you a little story. Um, uh, I wrote a dissertation 30 years ago, um, a regional forecasting model of the hospital sector. Uh, and my job at a consulting firm was to do forecasting of hospital costs and hospital input prices. And I had a very fancy 55 equation model for uh, each of the components of hospital inputs from wages and supplies and in, even including utility cost. Um, and there was only one part of my modeling that was really good, and that was utility cost. Because there was a young man who worked for me, Andy Rettenmeyer, who would call the Chicago utility authorities and would ask them, what are your price increases going to be? And they would go through their uh, community assessments, their infrastructure plans, their staffing and operational plans, and what they were doing politically to get their price increases approved. And they were almost always approved, so I was spot on on forecasting, forecasting with finger quotes, so utility prices. When people ask me what the future of public health is going to be, um, I don't see the forecasting of public health as something that one sees in the future, but rather it's something that we make. Not that I want public health to be uh, like a utility company, although there, there could be worse things, I suppose, but it's, a, it's put upon us to have uh, an understanding of our community, to put together infrastructure plans, to put together staffing operational plans, and then have the political work done so that public health isn't what we see, public health is what we make it. Um, and we have to think strategically, as strategically as utility companies and anyone else about where we have our spot uh, in the economy. Um, uh, and I think that you know the, the, the crisis of spending $3.3 .3 trillion, the crisis of 
the population of San Diego being currently something 13 or 14 percent over the age of 65, that will be double that by 2050, is going to force us into a position where we have to make plans and think strategically. Um, and I'm actually very hopeful that uh, before I leave this uh, planet, uh, that we will have that political will and that strategic planning that you're being taught by folks here at SCSU to make that happen. That's very true. I, I, I have to add to that one more thing, which is uh, before moving to New York, I was a dean of public health in another state. And every time I sat at a dinner event with somebody next to me at the table, and they asked me, what is public, what do you do? And I'd say, <laughs> oh, I'm the dean of public health. They'd, tell, they'd say, oh, that's like giving health care to the poor, isn't it? <laughs> I swear to God, if I heard that comment one more time. <laughs> <laughs> and so part of our issue here is we have to communicate our mission, and we have to share the ownership of our mission. We, the WHO has set our standard, our bar, very high because it talks about health in the context not just of physical, the absence of disease, but physical health, emotional and mental health, and even spiritual health. So we need to share our mission with others. We will not be able to reach that level without sharing our mission with others, number one. Number two. We cannot transform as much as I am totally committed to advocacy. We cannot transfer our enthusiasm to public health only in advocacy. We have to know how to do something. I don't want another graduate that can stand on a soapbox and lecture me about public health. They need to go into the kitchen and make it. <laughs> They need to have the recipe. They know how to make the omelette, not talk about how lovely an omelette can be as fluffy and as delicious as it can be. That is our mission. It is contradictory because on the one hand, we have to maintain the passion. We have to communicate the passion. We have to spread the word. But as my colleague said, we have to know how to do something and do it and prove to the world that we can. Today, there are 70,000 applications to schools of public health to get a degree in public health. There are 15,000 applicants like you getting into schools of public health. In 10 years, it's going to be 150,000 people. In 20 years, it's going to be a generation of public health professionals. You are a force. You have to believe in your collective power. The future of public health is in your hands, not in mine. I'll be long buried, <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be out there making a difference. I, I, I want to just, I, I, I want to tag on to some of the comments I'm hearing, and I, I don't know what the future of public health is. You know, if I had a crystal ball, I tell you, I tell you also when Madonna would retire and we could all be done with her. But, <laughs> but come on, it's time. Um, but I, what I, but I, what I do, he you know, I'm right. Uh, <laughs> what I'm, what I'm hearing here, though, it resonates with me a couple of things. One. I think one of the things that, that challenges our discipline is silos. Mm -hmm. Silos of yeah. science versus advocacy. Why can't do these things have to be separate from mm -hmm. each other? Why can't they be a continuum, right? So that's number one. Number two, I want, st I want students to have the skills, and I think we're, we teach them how to do a t-test, right, and write a paper, but what I think we're not doing right, maybe we're doing that, but I don't think what we're doing really, really, what we're not doing well in our schools is teaching your generation how to then take that information and make it powerful and meaningful and translate it into the real world, right? So I don't want another set of people who can like tell me what an incident rate is and what a t-test is and blah, 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 blah. I want somebody who actually sits at the crossroads of epi and biostats and policy and advocacy and community engagement and puts it all together and makes, this, I'm going to say the soup, not the omelet, a soup. 
that is rich and hearty and doesn't live in this disconnected place. I think this, the, 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 the new Steve criteria that just came out last year are forcing us to do this, to break down those silos. I want us to break down the silos in our discipline. I want you to be in rooms with social workers. I want you to be in rooms with psychologists. I want you to be in rooms with nurses. Because in the real world, these are the people you're going to work with. You're not going to work with, not work with public health people. So break down the, the silos and st let's stop the artificial dich dichotomization. Adding to that, I think that it's very important, and I believe that the future it depends on what we do today. It's nothing magic there. It's depending on what, what we do today, that's going to be our future. So I think that we need to start with a vision. What do we really want? our profession to be, how can we impact our world, and then the thing that we need to do right now in terms of working, and, and I, I just want to follow up what we have to be doing in our schools and programs is really doing more of the skills rather than knowledge. Yes. The knowledge is changing every time, but the skills. Mm -hmm. So the so-called soft skills, that I'm really against of that because they are not, nothing of soft. I mean, the, the real skills right now is how you communicate with others. How do you work in teams? How do you collaborate? How do you advocate? How do, are you active? Those are the skills that we need today in order to make the future really a better, a better future. So I think that in the schools and programs, we need to emphasize more what are the skills that our, our students are really developing in order to really make uh, our world uh, a better world. So I, I want to add to the uh, issue of silos. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, when I was 23, I started the MPH program at UCLA, and they made me take environmental health science, health education. I was doing epidemiology. I, did bio I, I just could not figure out why the heck they were making me do that. You know, and it, it didn't make any sense. I wanted to do epidemiology. Leave me alone. Biosat, I know I need it. I took this other course in health services research. Paul Torrens taught that course. And you know what? All of that stuff became extremely important. So I couldn't agree more that we want you coming out of our educational programs to get the connections, understand how these disciplines, these silos, they're not really silos, they're different prisms of the same issues that we have to deal with. And I, I would also agree that now that we see there's a shift in, in how we're going to accredit our programs now, the competency-based things are moving us more toward mm -hmm. that. And I'll just tell you, in medical schools, they've done the same thing. Now it's problem-based solving. You're not just doing your anatomy and biochemistry. Now you're in these groups trying to solve more complex problems. So I think we're moving in that direction. I think the, the competencies, the new competencies we're operating under now are going to move us further in that direction. But I, I couldn't agree more that we need to push that further. And the advocacy is an, it is an element of the same. It's one end of the spectrum here. I think uh, there's a field of implementation science that some of you may have heard about. And I think you know, the field is basically we know a lot. We've discovered a lot. We know what will save people. We know what will make people healthy, but we're not doing it. So the issue of, and, and I have to say that our former NIH director, uh, Dr. Zerhouni, who came up with a roadmap, you know, he actually at least put down on paper stuff that people were working on before, but he kind of coined that term implementation science as part of translational research. So the, 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 the far of translational research is impacting the population in a positive way. It's not just doing pure discovery, the basic level, it's moving it all the way through to actually affecting people's lives. So, but I think we all have to come out of our educational programs understanding that. So I would agree with not siloing us. So I have a question for Nick since I don't know the answer. How many <laughs> county agencies are integrated like yours? So um, there is a growing uh, momentum to integrate uh, the different disciplines, uh, departments of within public health, but across with health and human services and, and housing. We are the largest such integrated agency in the country uh, locally uh, with all the traditional public health, um, health care, uh, Medicaid, but housing and human services. And so I, why I was uh, um, really enjoying this conversation is that I have a master's in public health, I'm a faculty member here, but in my day job, I deprogram people thinking from the profession of public health and explain for a moment. The fidelity is not to the profession. Let me be explicitly clear. You can put your public health flag, fidelity, see where that gets you. The fidelity is to the cause. The fidelity is writing the sequel to the IOM report that Steve Wolf did of 
longer lives, better health, not shorter lives, poorer health. And don't get me wrong, we need to triple public health. But there's already a stigma that public health, medicine, you compartmentalize. So that's why how we framed 10 years ago was around wellness. When you framed it, it was us, the public health types, the strategists, the architects, who framed it, where then it brings everyone in. And so we have 6,300 people that work for the Healthy Human Service Agency, social workers, epidemiologists, uh, public health uh, educators, all environmentalists, all types. They don't fight with each other or with the physicians or with the psychiatrists. The fidelity is to the cause. So we, I could tell you in San Diego, the future of public health is here, it's now. It's driving on population-based wellness. And our model's being replicated across the country. Talking to places like Louisiana State and p parts of back east. Six states, the northern states of Mexico, Viva Ben Mexico. The reality is I'm still looking for the person I'll find people who don't want ACA and their political ideology, and I haven't found a person, irrespective of political ideology, who doesn't want wellness. And so we have to do a better job on how, as those leaders, because I do say that in public health, we are in that leadership role, no doubt. And I think we, we table set that ecosystem and understand the ecosystem. But how you frame things can get us to, for instance, the community benefit and getting where those dollars are trapped, you know, in the healthcare side, how we are now reinvesting in the public prevention side. So I, I think as the road is and the battles are had in, in DC, and thank you for the fight in DC to get us more. In the meantime, the pot is the pot of resources. It's how we use and leverage those resources because people's lives, as it's been pointed out, ca are counting on them. Before I go on to the next question that we have, there are some questions coming in on Twitter that all kind of seem to have um, a consistent theme. That theme is <coughs> practical experiences where you have seen successful collaboration across silos and perspectives and um, the question reading exactly how do we better conduct the public health research and translate that into practice and application for advocacy and in your experience where have you seen successful collaboration across silos and perspectives that's a few questions that have come in on Twitter that I just think we should probably address now before we move on to the next topic very forward-thinking program in New York City called the Public, he the Primary Healthcare Initiative, uh, uh, and it goes to the various boroughs in New York City to investigate with community-based organizations um, what has become uh, very popular now, which is the social determinants of health, meaning thinking of perspectives that might impact on the health of people living in that borough, within that community that is not directly related to the healthcare delivery system. And some people talked about exercise, some people talked about safety, uh, some people talked about housing. Um, for example, one of the major problems we have in New York City is mold in housing and repairs in the heating and cooling system within uh, low-income housing projects. Um, we also uh, are finding great difficulty providing exercise opportunities for people that are sequestered in communities where culturally, psychologically, uh, physically, they feel isolated. And to be honest, the advocacy uh, groups that belong to that primary health care initiative, FIP it's called in New York City, reached out to organizations, for example, in the area of exercise, went to boutique like exercise uh, programs and found many 
wonderful young volunteers that were willing to take their exercise training programs to housing facilities. Nobody had asked them. They were making good money. You know, some of these personal trainers in New York, they make very good money. And they said, I would love to volunteer once a week in a housing project. Who would have thought that? <laughs> so part of our problem is to reach out. Before thinking, does it work? We don't reach out enough. We sometimes complain too much. And there are a lot of resources that are out there in the community that are willing to participate. Same thing for healthy foods. How much are we reaching out to the food industry looking for opportunities of providing healthy foods to, uh, to, pro to communities that don't have access? We have a, a program now evaluating the renovations. New York City has invested $250 million in park renovations. Nobody's trying to understand how this is going to impact on the health of communities. Asphalt has been tr you know, transformed into grass. Fencing has been brought down. Accessibility to people with special needs. And we are beginning to see that this is impacting on the people, how they view the parks in their communities. Some of them have thought of them as drug infested and dangerous zones. Once they've been renovated and open, they are using them more. We're trying to evaluate how they work and how they influence their health. So there are a lot of intersections. We need to be innovative in the way we approach potential partners, sell our priorities to them, and know how to work in tandem. This is what the public health culture is. And assuming that they will come to us, it is our role to go out to them. So there are examples. I, I, think, what, I think what I'm saying, what I hear very clearly, is bring it to the people, right? right. And so, um, you know, I'll, I'll speak in the terms of the HIV world, which is the world that I've worked in for the last 20 something years. If you, if you want to, 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 if you want to put, curtail HIV and other sexually transmitted infections in gay men, you go to where gay men are, which is to bars and to bathhouses, and you set up testing at those places. You don't wait for them to come to you. When you're trying to get injection drug users to clean, 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 get clean needles, you actually, you actually put the mobile van in neighborhoods where they can come to you and very confidentially and easily, right, get those clean needles. So bringing it to the people happens that way very structurally. But bringing it to the people also means that we have to get the message out there to the people, right? And so I need another paper like I need another hole in the head on my CV, right? But what I do need to do, and what I, have, I for, force my, and I'm going to use the word force, my students do because it's an assignment in their classes, is write helpful pieces like d put public service announcements together, write op-eds, write, write, do the kind of writing that's going to impact people in, an ev in their everyday lives. So bringing it to the people intellectually, but also bringing it to the people physically. One of the things we've, we've been studying in my research center lately is um, health care in young gay men and why young men, gay men, are not accessing, accessing health care. Well, because men get health care less than women to begin with. Young gay men, it's no different than them. It's because they are not going to go out of their way to look for it. All right? So what do we do? We need to go to them. We need to bring PrEP to them. We need to bring STI testing to them. We need to bring the knowledge to them. And so I think those, ha I think in some ways public health right now, in, the, in 2018 is shaped by, what, by the activism of the, of the 1980s. And so the lessons that we learned in those days actually shapes how we think about these social determinants thing. And so I say, as, as, as my dear colleague from New York has just pointed, bring it to the people. So um, medicine and public health have a lot uh, of overlap, of concern, uh, of, of patients uh, getting care and getting preventive care. Um, and uh, one of the most significant public health advances we had during the administration uh, of the last president was the Affordable Care Act. Now, a number of states decided not to play in this game, and the states that did, some of them came in slowly. Uh, I'm in Louisiana, which uh, fortunately, two years ago, uh, uh, elected a progressive governor who accepted Medicaid expansion. Um, uh, enabling uh, 600,000 people to get insurance and as part of the Affordable Care Act to get preventive services at no out-of-pocket cost. Um, uh, and this has been uh, an important success for the state. Um, 
but no one in the state thinks that they've won a battle or they've won a war. This is something, a step forward, and to prevent a move back, it has to be explained to everyone what this public health story meant. So uh, any of you who are interested in this can look at the uh, uh, Louisiana State uh, website. Uh, and on the website uh, for the Department of Health, uh, you can look at Medicaid. And it provides a map of the state. And on every single parish in the state, we do parishes instead of counties because we still live in uh, an ancient time. Um, uh, but you can click on every parish and it tells the citizens and the elected officials in those parish how many people have health insurance newly. How many of those people got preventive care services? How many of those women got mammograms? And an estimate from the epidemiologists of how many lives were saved. This is a huge success that they were able to achieve, which it was helpful to both medicine and public health but the communication process now of preventing this from being taken away will be enduring. And, and, and Dr. Gee and Michelle Leto know this, and they're trying to push forward, but they also know they need to learn from places like San Diego about how to make further advances that don't rely upon uh, something happening from the federal government in the near term. All right, the next question, I am personally very excited to hear the discussion about. Um, we've seen a lot of critical public health problems in this country, uh, from smoking to obesity to hepatitis A here in San Diego County, to the massive rise in opioid and drug-related deaths in the recent years. What do you see as the next big problem that public health professionals will be faced with? <laughs> and again, there is no crystal ball as was brought up, but please feel free to uh, talk about chronic diseases, health behaviors, infectious diseases. There's a lot of uh, students in here that are undergraduates that are pursuing a career in public health. There are several master students about to graduate. There's faculty. And just kind of uh, give us your perspectives and your professional opinion on what you think our careers will be faced with. You only knew, so <laughs> I. Uh, yeah. So uh, one of my childhood friends, Craig Shapiro, was, was with the CDC for many years, and he just retired about five years ago. And they called him up to do the Zika thing, and he's actually in Puerto Rico now. Uh, he lives in Bethesda. But I was, but it, I just I, I, I heard uh, Anthony Fauci came to our American College of Epidemiology meeting uh, last year, and Dr. Fauci has been the longest serving director of a NIH institute of any of anybody ever. And he actually did his talk by the presidents. He started when he started with Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. And he li listed out the emerging diseases for, under each president. And I thought, this is like a setup for a, for a book he must be writing. It was just <laughs> incredible. Um, I, I would tell you, you know, part of what we learn is to be able to handle the unknown, the unexpected. I mean, that's really it. If you try to predict these infectious epidemics that we've had to deal with, that's one example. Uh, I'll tell you, so Laura invited me to be part of a uh, panel uh, at the ASPPH meeting on natural disasters. And uh, so we, it was very interesting. And I was assigned to talk about the California wildfires. And you would think with the history that we've had in our state here of dealing with these kinds of disasters that we wouldn't have had loss of life like this. There were 44 people that died in Northern California fires. Uh, one firefighter, one civilian died in the Southern California fires only, which is amazing. And there were 20 people that were killed in Montecito from the mudslides. That was this year. And uh, lessons learned. Well, the front page of the LA Times on Sunday was about what went wrong. And my wife actually works in the Office of Emergency Preparedness for uh, the California Department of Public Health in Sacramento. And she, got, she started her job a month before the Sonoma and Napa fires started there. And it was activated. It was very interesting. And before I got ready for our ASPPH meeting, I went ahead and tried to dig up what I could. And, and so the LA Times on Sunday this week basically said, 
it was a breakdown of communication. Now, who would have known? Okay, and Southern California actually, the counties in Southern California were much more sophisticated than Northern California in that they had the, the uh, wireless alert system. All of them were active, whereas Napa turned it down completely, and Sonoma was still thinking about it. Okay, so um, I just think that what we will learn in our education and our work experience, you have no idea what's going to happen next. And I want us all to get the skill set and have an open-minded thought process about being able to solve unknown problems. But who knows, right? The, and by the way, the opioid epidemic is not over yet, of course, right? Not. We're we're just starting. Yep. Yeah. So I'm uh, at ASPPH a couple weeks ago. We had uh, Sam Quinones speak, who wrote Dreamland. Mm -hmm the story of the, the opioid epidemic problem. And we had our colleagues uh, from University of Pittsburgh who have an incredible database on their website about opioid uh, addiction and deaths by state uh, over the past, uh, uh, past two decades. Uh, and what is really astounding about it, both from the story, the human lives that, that Sam brought to the table, and the data from Pitt, is we should have seen this coming. Yeah. Right. It's something that the number of deaths yeah. has doubled every two or three years, and, and in our data, we should see that coming. And it's, it's somewhat embarrassing that uh, in two years from now when you have this panel again, <laughs> that uh, the different people uh, here might have said, well, those people three years ago should have told you X, Y, and Z because the data were so clear. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, uh, but you're right. We 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 don't have the sort of uh, depth uh, of uh, of an analytical capabilities getting into the data that that I think we will have. I think uh, the the Californians, perhaps more of those northern Silicon Valley Californians, but the ones here in San Diego as well. Uh, we'll capture big data in ways uh, that will help us at least to see some of these trends before they hit us in the face like opioids have. Uh, and, and I'm really hopeful that, that the tech-savvy big data generation will, will be able to, to tackle some of these things ahead of time. So I'm going to say that even though we don't know what the next one is, the first message that Laura gave us on minding the gap is probably the one that we still need to remember, whether it's today or tomorrow or five year, years down the road, that's probably the, re, is the big thing and will remain the big thing, is that the reality is there are health disparities we are not addressing. There are health disparities, whether they are by race and ethnicity, whether they are by state, whether they are by um, gender, these are significant issues and it doesn't matter because whether you look at the opioid epidemic, there's health disparities. Whether you look at HIV AIDS, there are health disparities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think minding the gap is one of the most significant things we can do in public health in, in trying to address some of the issues that we are currently dealing with and we'll continue to deal with. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. I think that, you know, look, there's an, there's an infectious disease that we don't know about around the corner somewhere waiting to happen. You know, for 100 years, infectious disease deaths were down, and then we had this thing called AIDS, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So I think there's stuff out there that we're not even beginning to think about. Right. Two, climate change, mm -hmm. right? But I'm going to say something a little less obvious and a little more esoteric, violence. Mm -hmm. um, violence in our world violence in our communities, violence against women, violence against people of color, violence against LGBTQ people, intimate partner violence. I think these are all public health dilemmas. And I think that we're just scratching the surface on, on, on those issues. And I think in this increasingly polarized world, we're gonna see more and more of it. And it's gonna take its toll on people emotionally, which is a public health crisis, and physically. I will say something a little less dramatic than many of these <laughs> things. And I will tell you that last year, for the first time in human recorded history, more people died from overeating than undereating. Ever. The crisis that we meet globally, and as somebody that has worked in global health and continues to wor work in global health, and the onslaught of the self-interest of food industry 
that is totally blinded to and unresponsive to the health needs of the populations that use this industrial product will destroy human health. Food that is legal but lethal, including fat unregulated, salt unregulated, carbohydrate unregulated, and sugar unregulated diet is killing us every day. The 3.3 trillion dollars that we're spending, 60% of them are directed at chronic diseases that are preventable, if you listen to Laura's presentation. Many of these are driven by food. Food industry is, has become an enormous opponent for health professionals. We are unable to confront them. Many of you have heard of the horrible failure of regulation of serving size for sugary drinks in New York City mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was turned around by the food industry as an issue of social equity. That unless somebody has the freedom of taking a liter with a, a kilogram of sugar dissolved in it, then we were not doing right by their social justice. And they won. So the food industry is not an innocent bystander, number one. Number two, the communication and alteration of the palate mm -hmm. of people. In the smallest village in Southeast Asia, I see a McDonald. What on earth, and I was going to use a bad word. <laughs> What on earth is the Big Mac doing <laughs> in that small Asian village that was eating tofu and minding its own business and living till they were a hundred? So it's a global problem. It's a ubiquitous problem. It's an insidious problem. And the opponent is out there standing tall and confronting any kind of criticism and any kind of onslaught on their profit margin. I think that this is a perfect segue into the final question that we have for the evening. So again, if you have questions for the panel, please, on Twitter, use this hashtag, because I have one more question to ask the panel, and then Actually, we will then turn to May I say that that will be the last question in general, because we have two of our wonderful panelists who are trying to make a flight to New York <laughs> before <laughs> the so snowstorm so hits. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so okay. I apologize. Don't this use the Twitter hashtag. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Bury the hashtag. We'll send, yeah. we'll send it out, but yes, okay. thank you. So the <laughs> last and final question for the evening is a bit of a uh, heavier, more applied question. Going forward from this point, how do we as public health professionals get a seat at the table that enables us to address these non-traditional public health problems that were brought up, such as gun violence, sexual assault, uh, violence, uh, inner partner crime, intimate partner crime? Food. Food. <laughs> Food. Food. Donald. Just, just. <laughs> Anything that's considered to be non-traditional public health, or they're treated as non-traditional public health problems in this country, how do we as public health professionals get a seat at that table and make a change? Run for politics. <laughs> <laughs> run, run for, for office. No, I'm, I'm vote. Vote, vote. Yeah, that's certainly it. Yeah. Well, change the paradigm. Like you, you like you. It's, a, it's in your look. I'm an act up guy. We change. Uh, we changed the paradigm in the 1980s. We were dying. Right, we took the we took the battle into our own hands. Right, didn't mean that people didn't die; they still died. But we changed the way that the pharmaceutical companies were working. We changed access to medications, and we changed the course of the epidemic. Right, not fast enough. You can change the paradigm. Like you demand that conversation about violence and interpartner violence are public health issues. You need to say it because when you say it and you say it and you say it and you say it and you say it, people will believe it. 
and this is one where we're siloing our actions probably won't won't help us. There are acting up on the outside to make change, to make uh, to bring to light what is happening is important, uh, but also being on the inside. The people that go into health management and policy will become hospital CEOs and can change where they spend their community benefit dollars that Medicare is giving them. The people that go into health behavior uh, will work for some agricultural companies and from the inside seek to make changes. So I think we need to both be so inside and outside and sneaky as all get out. And I'm not sure if we have a class on Sneaky 203 yet. <laughs> it's not a 101 oh, class. It's in the seat criteria. Okay. <laughs> well, I would say that some of you, I hope, will become educators for public health students. Okay, let's think about the next generation here. I mean, it won't be all of you, but part of what we do as educators is to educate people to educate the next generation. And, uh, and I think, again, keeping a flexible, open perspective on things will allow us to inculcate ourselves into things that were non-traditional areas. I think, uh, so, so you don't know what the next epidemic's gonna be. You don't know what the next crazy, violent thing's going to be. Uh, we've got, you know, obviously school kids now that are, that are showing up at state capitol saying, you know, enough is enough. Um, so, you know, we, we need to be there for folks, but I also think we need to generate, we have to teach the next generation of folks after you guys, and somebody's going to have to be responsible for that. We, we will be six feet under, I think. I don't plan to be. Well, okay. <laughs> I'm going to live forever, I know. <laughs> I would say uh, raise your voice, be mm. active, and work outside public health, and I completely yeah. agree one or two or more were saying the same thing. I, I yes, I deeply think that uh, there's a lot to do, of course, among ourselves, but the more we work outside public health, I mean, in, like transportation and urban and architects and the engineer and all of the others, and just, just uh, you know, bring the public health perspective in all of those areas and talk about wellness, and I really like that because wellness is where we really meet. If we go to the, you know, with the architects and say, well, well, let's build this community for the wellness, not for the, you know, for uh, eliminating disease, but they wouldn't understand that. But if we said wellness, they, they would come up with, oh, yes, we can, you know, build this street in order for the people to walk or to use their bikes. I think we need to uh, try to concentrate in what it makes us common. What, it make, what is our language that we really have the same with the rest of the people in order to really advance or so I think and, and again I, I completely agree that our hope is in you in the next generation I think that you will make this life uh, better and we're gonna be living you know quality lives because of you the changes that you're gonna make in your communities and the things that you are learning just right now. you're seeing the solution mm -hmm. he's sitting right there <laughs> next to Hala somebody <laughs> you. You. I, I'm going to be under a man, <laughs> a man who has high ethical standards, who represents you politically, who is not bought by special interest. Yep. Any such man will see the value of public health and will promote your interest. Youth today, we're walking in Washington D.C., demanding that their representatives would not be bought by the arms industry. They are on the lookout. Look at your candidates carefully. See where they raise their money. Look at where their loyalties and their affiliations are before you vote for them. And help choose candidates that stand for your beliefs. That's how we change the world in a democratic system. This is a message that is needed today more than it has been needed in the history of this country for a very long time. And I would add and say it's um, not getting a seat at the table, but I'll get back to setting up the table. So you're all visionary leaders, and so, but a word of caution, because uh, you're not faint of the heart. Visionary leaders are seeing what everyone else is seeing, but knew it, doing what no one else is doing at the cost of mockery by the present for the betterment of the future. Mockery Lane 
is often where our field goes. Uh, mocked in that we're not, uh, you know, health care or we're not doing all the things that, that, that the society sees because we can't really see prevention. They can't. Well, we know we can feel it and sense it, but the general public has a hard time. So tonight, what you can do is think about in your graduate dorm, setting up a table of conversation, in your neighborhood or in your home at the dinner table, or at a volunteer organization, it's getting involved. And I love the idea about the, the issue about uh, voter registration. Live Well San Diego, one of our metrics on wellness is voter registration, not fi pitching political ideology. But we know that a public that's engaged is a public that will become much more educated and aware and has the voice. That is why I've been able to use more resources for our public health prevention because we have brought in 350 different organizations to join our movement. Here's the cool thing. It's a social movement. How do we start social movement? Just like when we get in our cars, we're not even going to think of twice for putting that seatbelt on. How do we create social movements that are going to have the sustainability, the resiliency, and we're going to institutionalize to make sure they continue? And that is why there is great hope because there is a thirst out there in the community. I can tell you that. And our biggest challenge is, as a nation, as a nation, we are resource-rich, innovation poor. We need to find the ideas, the political candidates, but the ideas and the engagement of people coming together on a vision that we all share, the wealthy and the poor, that benefits us all. That creates the movement so that we can bring the business community in. We can bring in all those other sectors, the food industries, who become live well partners and now are doing blood pressure screenings and tagging baby friendly foods and now giving food to the poor. That's the effort, that's the social movement we have to do until it gets right sized in DC. And that may take some time. I think at the grassroots level, and I agree, I did my training on the AIDS epidemic in New Jersey. I think it really depends on us because it's not gonna happen in Sacramento or DC for us. The last word? To sure, you. well, I mean, I wanna think, my one last word is not on answering the question. My last word is <laughs> actually thanking a wonderful panelist for being here, for flying in to do this. for being here tonight. I hope that you enjoyed it. In fact, my students, I hope I do not hear again that you do not like teamwork because that is the foundation of public health. <laughs> no complaints for about those team assignments, right? That's, that is the, one of the foundations of what we do in public health. Mm -hmm. So thank you again to our wonderful student council for all their efforts to them. <laughs> to the airport. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. I know I'm staying up.